Can we welcome from Convoy of Hope, John French, who is with us today. All of our campuses are watching. Come on, a very special guest who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. And do you know when you, I really felt like there was a huge part of what I feel God's called us to do as a church is to make sure we're responding to what happens in our nation and around the world, when and where and how we can. You'll remember with our own military right here, Extortion 17, and we took a special offering for that. We invited our other collective churches to participate in that because that was something that really rocked our military, and that's right here in Virginia Beach. Um, the Virginia Beach shooting at the city council buildings, and again, we as Legacy gave generously to each of those families to just let them know we see you, we feel you, and we are praying for you. And I, I felt like I was looking for a, a way in which we can find someone that we can work with that whenever something's going on, whether it be local, regional, state, or just in our nation or global, that we could really be part of a bigger institution and be part of a bigger answer. And several years ago, I met Convoy of Hope. Now, yeah. John, your role is the Network Relations Director of Convoy of Hope. Uh, you've served in a church ministry for more than 20 years, so you've got a good church background. You love the local church. A stage four cancer survivor, and I probably want to start with that, understands what it means to have hope attacked. Uh, after an intense battle by God's grace, you are now in complete remission. So yes, thank sir. God for that. Yes, sir. Yeah. You are married to the same person, same wife. Yes. Have three children, Sophia, Jonathan, and Caden. Yes. Sir. So welcome, and it's an Thank honor you. to have you, you here today. It really Thank is, you. as a represent, representative of Convoy Hope. The more I get to know Convoy Hope over these last several years, the more I like them. And the deeper I go with them, the more I love who they are and what they do. And I love it because their real desire is to work through a local church. And, you know, when we say about a hurricane somewhere or a response to a disaster, we'll talk about Puerto Rico, Ukraine, and Hurricane Ian, the more three recent things. Yes. I want you to know, way, church, that don't ever wonder, what are we doing? We're already there. Yes. We are in a strategic partnership with Convoy Hope, and we can do more together than we ever could by ourselves. 100%. And I yes. want you to always know, that's what I'm so glad to be a part of of what is what we now partner with with Convoy. But I want you to talk to us. How did you get to be, what, how did you become a part of Convoy? What drew you to that organization? Well, thank you so much uh, for having uh, me here today and, and being a part of the Convoy family. Um, so in 2017, I was diagno diagnosed with a rare form of cancer called mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, it's very rare, especially in, in younger men. And uh, when we went through that process, uh, part of the process that the doctors really leaned heavy on whenever we found out, I, we don't know uh, how much time we had. We know the doctor told us to get our affairs in order. 60% of my blood was infected. Uh, every area of my body that has lymph nodes, or there's four areas, all had cancer <clears throat> in it. And so um, we wouldn't let the doctors, I would not let the doctors give any negative reports, not because I didn't want to hear it, because I just believed that if it got in my head, it was going to live there. So one of the main things that they talked about was we had to get, I had to get rest as a part of, we went through six months of chemo. Um, every other month I was in the hospital for two days with, with the therapies. At the end of that, we did a full stem cell transplant in the hospital for 21 days. And so in the middle of that, the doctor said, really the main part of um, you getting through this is you have to rest. And so uh, if you've, anyone's ever gone through a sickness or somebody in your family is sick or even just a hard time of life, it's hard to get sleep. You're thinking about yourself, you lay down at night, your mind's playing over. So I had this idea, it's probably way bigger than I thought it was, I probably should have Googled it, but I thought every night when we put our kids to bed, we do a routine, the same routine gets our kids to bed. We put them in bed, we read them a story, we turn off the lights, we turn on the music, and that slowly tells them, hey, it's time to go to sleep. So I wondered, could I do the same thing for myself? Could I create a nightly routine that every night I could walk through this routine and it would help get me to sleep? And so I created a routine that still now Four years later, I can still walk through the routine at night and it'll put me pretty much sound asleep. But the last thing that I wanted to do before I went to sleep was I wanted to read about something other than myself. I, I didn't wanna just sit there and, and think about myself. And I got my hands uh, on a book that was written by our founder, Hal Donaldson, called Your Next 24 Hours. 
And the basic premise of the book is what's the next kind thing you can do in the next 24 hours? Things like giving your neighbor cookies or checking on someone. Before you sue someone, go and talk to them. Just very practical how to be like Jesus in the next 24 hours. I gotta, I gotta laugh, yeah. Maybe that was for some of you in the room. So, <laughs> thus saith the Lord. But, um, so with that, Every night, it was 24 short chapters, and every night I read a chapter of that before I went to bed, and it got my mind off of me, and how can I love my neighbor? How can I see somebody else differently? And it really endeared me to Hal. I, I, I met him, our, our church was partnered with Convoy. I have a couple relatives that worked for Convoy, so I knew them, but not extremely deep. And so spending that time reading his book, then at the end of the, the cancer battle, when 2018 came up, uh, Convoy called and said, would you be interested in coming and working for us? And um, honestly, I didn't go to work for Convoy, I went to work for Hal, because I truly believe in him, what he's done in Convoy, one of the most humble men you've ever met. And so for me, I said, I would love to, to be a part of that. And so that's kind of the journey that got us to, to Convoy. I, I, did you hear all the wisdom that just came out of what he just said? Number one, he's facing a life-threatening illness, and he's gonna train himself how to sleep, because he needs rest. That's profound wisdom. Number two, he wanted to make sure he didn't just think about himself because when you actually are in a crisis, if you're not careful, you cannot become yeah. cut off. Self-consuming. Yeah, and that can preoccupy you yeah. where you said, I'm going to read a book about how to help others. You also talked about you wouldn't let the doctors give you their diagnosis of time. You realize your time is in God's hands. Yes, sir. Uh, there's a lot of wisdom right there. <laughs> How to handle sickness. That's yeah, thank wonderful. Thank you. You also said something I'm a firm believer is, is that you find out your alignment and then you find out your assignment. Yes, sir. And you find out who God's called you to be with. And then God blesses from beyond there. Yes, sir. So thank you for all that. Now let's talk about Hal for a minute because yes, sir. Hal's really the guy who started this. And what really, his interaction with Mother Teresa is really instrumental. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. So Hal, when he was in his uh, young teens, his uh, mother and father were on their way to a church board meeting and were struck by a drunk driver. It killed his father immediately and debilitated his mother. And that evening, somebody asked, uh, the policeman asked the crowd, can somebody take them in? And a couple in their church said, we'll take them in. They were in a single wide trailer. What they probably thought was gonna be 48 hours or so ended up being uh, over a year's time of the mother rehabilitating all of them living in the same place. And so they went from being a middle-class family to extreme poverty overnight. And so if you've ever been in poverty, your main goal in poverty is to get out of poverty and to never go back. And so Hal went on that journey. He was an author by nature, so he began to write books, lots of books, very well-known author. And uh, on the back side of that, he got a chance to go to India to write a biography on a missionary that was there. And when he got off the airplane, the first thing the missionary said was, I want to take you to meet Mother Teresa. And so that was a very, very big thing. He wasn't expecting it. Uh, when he was sitting there talking to Mother Teresa, uh, Mother Teresa asked him, what are you doing to help the poor. And his words are, you shouldn't lie to Mother Teresa. Probably not a good yeah, idea. Yeah, probably not a good idea. <laughs> and so he said, honestly, I'm not doing anything. And she made the statement to him that said, everyone can do something. And that stuck in his spirit. And he came home with that thought and he, he couldn't release it. And so uh, a short time later, he began taking money out of his own check, buying groceries at a grocery store, putting it in the back of his truck and him and some friends driving into areas of town that needed groceries and just handing out groceries to people in need. And now 30 years later, that man that was handing groceries out of the back of his truck, this last year we've given out over seven million pounds of product uh, just here in the United States uh, that all just started out of the back of a pickup truck. And what I love about that is, again, just think about that. Hal lost his father, which I don't love that at all. Um, his mother was really, but a family. Took them in, and a, did you say a double wide trailer home? I, I believe it was a single wide, single but yeah, wide single wide trailer home. Yet a family took them in, yes. and that and that, that interaction with Mother Teresa birthed. I love that thought that you can't, you can, not all, not anyone can do everything, but everybody can do something, and that's what I love. And so, as a former pastor on a church team, what would you say about the role the church has to play with Convoy? I would say the, the church doesn't have a role with Convoy. The church has the role with Convoy of Hope. 
Everything that Convoy does is in and through the local church. Convoy is tethered to the local church. We believe that at some point, no matter what we're doing it, whether we're feeding a child or responding to disaster, at some point, Convoy's gonna leave, but that local church will remain. So we don't want them to ever think of Convoy came and helped me. We want them to think that local church helped me so that whenever their bellies are now full or the disaster has moved on, they can now say, it was the church that helped me in my time of need. And so it's a vital part of what we do. We really believe that we're just a conduit between churches. We're one church helping another church that's in the middle of a disaster, that's in the middle of a community that needs help. And so that's really our heart, is just to be a conduit. We don't really care if anybody ever knows our name. Uh, our goal is that they know the church's name and ultimately that God's name is made uh, known inside of those situations. And that is why I love Convoy of Hope. Right there, you just heard it. It's this, we want to actually make the local church the platform, the place where people, um, the church is there and the church is there to stay. And I, I love that. It's a little bit like John the Baptist. I must decrease, he must increase. You want to make sure that you're helping steward. And what yes, I love sir. about that is the Bible says one will put a thousand to fly, two will put 10,000. Yes, two sir. are better than one. That's why I love for us as a legacy, engaging in community and making sure we're living just beyond ourselves, that we're involved in something like what we're talking about. What does this year look like for Convo Hope? 2022 has been an interesting year. The last couple of years have been very interesting. Yeah. Um, this year, we've almost already responded to 60 natural and humanitarian disasters around the world. So even things you haven't heard about, I mean, you've heard about some of the obvious large ones, but even things that you haven't heard about, mudslides, um, things on borders of different countries. And so this, this last year, we've been able to uh, impact over 29 million people uh, around the world. Um, we've been able to do that with 7 million pounds of goods and services, as well as right around 30 million meals that we've been able to do. Outside of that, we feed 465,000 children every school day. We've trained over 30,000 women and girls and uh, trained about 18,000 farmers at this point this year. That's what we've done, church. Yes, That's together. what we've done. Isn't that amazing? Yes. And uh, so, I mean, here's a question for you, because how do you help people deal with what's called care fatigue? You just see one after another, um, how, how do you help people stay in the game? That's a fantastic question. I, I think the main thing for us is even though you hear these millions of numbers is that you realize that it's not about millions of numbers, it's about one, one person. Mm. Uh, that one child That's that good. was hungry, that because of our partnership with you we fed, yep. that one person that just lost their house to flooding, yep. or that family that just lost their house to a tornado, or that, that woman that didn't feel like she had worth or dignity, and now she has worth and dignity and is running a business. It's that one person. Because sometimes we can get caught up in the numbers and the big, and that's all great, but that's just 32 ones, yeah. or 32 million one people that have seen their lives changed. Um, they've seen Jesus be a part of their worst day. We like to say when people are having their darkest moment, we wanna bring the brightest light of hope. Mm. And so it's just that, that way you battle that fatigue is to say, man, it, that next one matters. Yeah. That next one matters. This next person is the one that matters the most. And, and I think a lot of times for us, especially here in America, the, the hurdle isn't necessarily fatigue as it is compassion distraction. Hmm. Things just move on. That's Things good. go so quick. Now in social media, I mean, there's still war going on in Ukraine. There, there's still Puerto Rico is, hmm. was devastated and that just kind of got moved on over. Ian is still going on. Hmm. So many things still happening, but our, our news cycle moves so quickly that we become distracted and lose sight of the people that still need help. I, I love that story about a little boy on the beach and all these starfish washed up on the, because of the tide, right. the tide went out. And these starfish were gonna die, of course, unless they, in the water. And so this little boy sees it and that the whole beach is covered in starfish and he walks down there and he starts picking up starfish and throwing them back out to sea. Yeah. And look, in all honesty, one little kid throwing a starfish back as, as for as long as, it, and finally this guy walks up to him and says, there are so many. What difference do you really think you're making? Because no matter how many he was picking up, there were still so many more. And he looked at this man, he goes, sure makes a difference to him. And he threw the starfish. That's right, that's exactly right. Isn't that a yeah, good thought? that's a great story. I wanna ask you my final question. What excites you the most about your role when it comes to working with churches? I love the local church. Um, and so I think what excites me is seeing the local church empowered to reach their community mm -hmm. because that's what we're called to do. And what I love is that, you know, when you see Jesus in the New Testament, when he comes to a crowd, usually one of the questions he asks is, who's feeding them? 
Where's the food coming from? He sees that there's a physical need and that when there's a physical need, usually if you'll meet somebody's physical need, they'll give you the opportunity to meet their spiritual need. I I like to say it, a full belly leads to a full spirit. And so I don't know if you've ever been hangry. Anybody in here ever been hangry? Yeah, I'm hangry a lot. And so it's hard, there's truth to it, right? So when you're hungry, it's hard to make decisions. You know, if I come home and there's a good meal on the table, I know my wife wants to have a long conversation. You know what I'm saying? Because she knows she's got to fatten me up. And so... But imagine if you're hangry and, and you don't have the option to not be. Yeah. Um, we have a, a, most of us have a good ability to be able to not be hungry if we don't wanna be. A lot of people around the world don't have that luxury. And so f- what I love is for us to be able to say, let us come alongside the church to meet physical needs and spiritual needs. Yeah. So we can open up the door to have conversations we can open up the door that somebody may never come to a church, but when they're in need, they'll drive through your parking lot mm-hmm. and receive something, and then God can do something in their heart that they're gonna come back to that church, yep. and they're gonna see God do something amazing inside of their lives. Mm-hmm. And so for me, that's what excites me, is just seeing the local church be the local church. Whenever you see our videos, if you see blue shirts, that's church people. Gray shirts are our people, but if you notice, there was very few gray shirts and a whole lot of blue shirts. And so we love just seeing people energized, we love seeing people reaching their communities, and ultimately seeing people come to Christ because we believe this, that, that is the physical that leads to that spiritual. You know, when I'm thinking about what Wave Legacy does, every year our, our goal is to make the world a better place. I often ask this question, if the church wasn't there, would the city miss the church? That's a great question. Because if the city wouldn't miss the church, the church really isn't touching the city. I, I believe in all of our campuses, the difference that we play with Wave City Care, with Wave Legacy, with all that we do and all of our community events, our school days, our serve days, our partnerships with this. I think about that scripture. We talked about care fatigue. And I love it because the disciples one time were kind of busting on this woman who gave a year's worth of wages, pouring out expensive oil on the feet of Jesus. And Judas Iscariot, well, he was ticked off because he would have considered that money he could have taken for himself. And he said, Lord, this money could have been given to the poor. And Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. And I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can misinterpret that verse. There's always going to be need. There's always going to be, you know, poor people. And there's always going to be. But that's actually what Jesus, that's not at all what Jesus was saying. He's going, listen, what this woman's done will be talked about for eternity. She is anointing my feet for burial. It's very in very profound scripture. And what he was actually doing was commending her generosity, the extravagance of her love. And I gotta tell you, people who were stingy, people who were tired, are always at a loss to understand the extravagance of love. When we know what God's done for us, we freely give out to those who are in need. Yes, Amen. Sir. Amen.